Yeah, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Our special guest this morning is uh, a, an emeritus in, in uh, political science, UH Manoa, a treasure, a treasure of UH Manoa, and a treasure of Think Tech, M Manfred Heddington. Uh, Manfred, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You're just back from Europe and you had a chance to observe, uh, and uh, you spent, you know, you, you were raised in Europe, so uh, it, it's through your eyes, it's going to be different and um, more, more in depth, I think. Um, so I'd like to discuss with you from a political science point of view um, exactly how it seemed to you on this trip, because things are changing in this world of ours. And that's clearly one of the changes in the US of A. And it must likewise be a change in various countries in Europe. Am I right? Yes, and especially in Germany. In, in, in some respect, you could say Germany today is the only uh, stable Western political society, uh, more stable than the US, more stable than the United Kingdom, more stable than France or Italy. It's quite remarkable uh, because you have the soft change of power from you know, Angela Merkel's 16 years to Scholz, but it's not that alone, which is so fascinating about contemporary Germany, it is a transition from traditional party politics to the green movement. Because what you have today in Germany is that the major coalition partner of uh, Scholz's Social Democrats are the Greens. And uh, when you look at recent polls uh, of uh, <coughs> politicians in Germany, you have Steinmeier, the president, on top, and then come four, then come three green members of Scholz's cabinet before Scholz himself. So what you have is that the Greens that started as a social movement uh, in the early 70s have become today a stable political party. There are no tensions within this Green Party as there were in the 70s between realists and fundamentalists, what you have are three very fascinating characters, uh, pragmatic and visionary at the same time. Uh, you know, the energy and treasury minister Habeck, uh, then the foreign secretary Annalena Baerbock, and then uh, the minister of agriculture, Özdemir, who is of Turkish background, these three uh, have become, uh, how should I say, the trio of uh, stability, but stability with a vision. I mean, if you want to use an American example, you should, one could say, well, imagine that the civil rights movement would have become the major political party in the United States and would run the country. Uh, that is what is happening in Germany, that the social movement, which uh, really attacked the system uh, for all kinds of reasons, you know, that you have uh, many progressives in this country attack uh, the political system, but uh, they have embraced it. They are part of the system, they run the system. Now, whether that will continue that is a big question because what you what Germany is facing maybe more so than than other uh, countries is this energy crisis. You know, when if if Putin even if Putin does not completely cut off gas delivery uh, to Germany, you will have uh, a very very difficult time not only for households but for the German economy. Uh, to find uh, resources uh, to substitute for what uh, had been, you know, for decades, the Russian supply line. I mean, that today people talk about not only Gerhard Schroeder, the former social democratic uh, chancellor, you know, a buddy, a bosom friend of, of uh, Putin, but also Angela Merkel, that they have both, in a way, relied too much uh, on 
Putin's promises, uh, even though they knew, well, uh, Schroeder maybe not so, uh, because he made a lot of money uh, as a result of that connection, you know, when he left office in 2005 and Angela Merkel took over. But uh, what you have, uh, what people recognize now that this dependency, uh, which was interpreted at the time, you know, when it started, as the best way of uh, somehow uh, not only domesticating Putin, but uh, to somehow uh, bring Russia into the Western Hemisphere, you know. Make, make, well, that was a good noble idea for sure. It was, it was, yes. But, uh, but, but it was a flawed idea because they, they could have... They yes. could have, should have known Putin better than that. Well, it's very interesting. You know, I watched uh, a few, a week ago or so, an interview with a former president of uh, Germany, Gauck, Joachim Gauck. He was the predecessor of Steinmeier. And he, you know, he was a, an Aussie. He was born in a GDR. He uh, was a pastor there. And... Uh, he met Putin a few times and he said, I, Gauck and Angela Merkel, whenever we met Putin and talked with him, we knew he was lying. We could not trust him, but we couldn't say that openly, you know, <laughs> that he was lying because, you know, you do not do that in diplomatic political circles. Uh, you had to be <laughs> very careful what you said. But we knew, we knew, uh, he said, I talked with Angela Merkel after meetings he, she had with, with Putin, that he was lying. You couldn't trust him. Now, what we didn't know, or at least he said, I didn't know, and I think Angela Merkel didn't know that either, that he has this grandiose vision of uh, restoring, you know, this uh, uh, Russian Soviet empire. There we were, I mean, this surprised him uh, tremendously. But I mean, it was very fascinating also. And I think it has to do with the changes that are happening in Germany today. He was asked by the interviewer, uh, if something like that should happen to Germany today, if you, know, you have this kind of attack, would you as a pastor, former pastor, would you use weapons? And he said, yes. You cannot let aggression like this, uh, you know, continue without uh, a response. I'm against this milieu pacifism, he said, that had uh, characterized Germany, you know, after World War II for over 70 years. Uh, and in a way, you could say uh, that is an, an atmospheric change in Germany in general, you know, that this pacifism. Uh, is uh, gone. And interesting is also that there is a generational divide. And this generational divide uh, is between the 18 to 30 years and then the people above. The people above are very careful and very hesitant, you know, in uh, being uh, very critical of Putin even though they are critical, but they're to being very critical. The young people, for them, it is not any longer possible to live in peace with Putin. So the people from 18 to 30 are absolutely in support of giving the Ukrainians the weapons they want. They need these weapons and they should be handed over to them, not only from the Americans, but uh, and other Western powers, but especially also from Germany. So there you have uh, a very fascinating transformation of uh, the political self-understanding of contemporary Germany. And I think it is very, very important that people understand it is not the social Democrats were the driving force. It's the Greens, the former social movement, anti, I mean, pacifist movement, uh, environmental movement. Uh, so what you have there is that when you compare that with what 
the chaos in Great Britain, all the possibilities, you know, that uh, France was confronted with uh, when you had the elections. Now, uh, Macron won against Marine Le Pen uh, in the presidential election, but in the parliamentary elections, you have the strong left under Mélenchon and on the right uh, under uh, Le Pen. When you're looking at the left and the right in Germany today, they destroy themselves. They are in, in a, they cannibalize each other. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, you know, how irrelevant the radical left and the radical right, the AFD, uh, people were scared of, uh, you know, for, for some time, how irrelevant they have become politically. Now, look, I say all of this uh, reflecting on this, the talks and, and uh, discussions and observations that I made during the last four weeks. I don't know what will happen once the energy crisis will hit Germany. Uh, I mean, that is, uh, and it will hit it more than it will hit uh, the United States or will hit uh, France because of uh, that dependency on uh, Russian gas. Now, uh, but if you have a Green Party, if you have the moral strength that Angela Merkel, um, you know, brought to Germany in her time, my, my view, you can agree or not, my, my view is that she, she found a moral strength in Germany and caused it to emerge politically. And Germany changed uh, under her leadership. Uh, well, I will, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I have a different opinion of that. I think Angela Merkel, um, Angela Merkel has come under attack because of her um, trust in Putin. Now, it's a, it was a critical trust, but she, as much as Schröder, the former chancellor, it, is making is uh, called response. I mean, they feel in the political debate uh, that Merkel was also responsible for the dependency, whatever her reasons were. Uh, I mean, she had no illusions about uh, Putin and uh, Russia. But you have to remember, they didn't do anything uh, in 2004, 2008, 2014, uh, when these, this violence, this brutal behavior of um, Russia under, under Putin became quite clear. Uh, she was critical, but she did not do what people thought she should have done at that time. So okay, but, but let, me, let me just go to my point though. Um, somewhere along the line, somehow, whether it was Merkel or some other process, some other phenomenon working in Germany, Germany has become uh, liberal. Um, it has become um, enlightened. Uh, okay. It has, it has um, taken off uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the kind of right-wing um, sensibility that it had during the war and then and, and we have seen we have seen people in Germany would like to return to to Nazism um, but but the country in general seems to be liberal now yes and, that, and that's a moral issue oh no and, absolutely and so what I what I'm asking you really is doesn't the strength of that morality doesn't that prevail uh, against say cold weather uh, against, say, um, you know, um, vectors that would undermine the German economy. That's what in, we have to see. In the see. U.S., we don't have that kind of cross-the-board morality. But if we have that in Germany, then they can resist the cold weather and well, they can carry on. No, you, uh, you're an optimist. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope, I hope that's true, but I don't know. You know, uh, when uh, the the cold begins to hit the fan, and the fan is as cold, you know, as, as it's outside. 
uh, I don't know what the responses will be, but you have also to remember, we are not only speaking about uh, people not liking to freeze, we are speaking about the German economy. And if uh, you know branches of the economy close down and you get uh, unemployment on a grand scale, uh, then I think uh, the uh, situation will become politically uh, less stable than it is today. Do you, but do you think do you think that the average German, you know, from your travels in Germany just uh, a few days ago, really, um, understands that it 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 falls to Germany to be a leader, if not the leader of Western Europe. France is not strong. The UK is not strong. Germany, at least for the moment, is strong. Yes. Uh, does, does the average German care to perpetuate that? Look, the average German uh, begins to recognize that. Uh, but in a way, you could also say uh, they refused to accept this identity. They didn't want to become, I mean, even though it's demographically the, the biggest country in Europe with 82 million, and it's economically uh, the strongest country within the European Union. But uh, there, is, there has always been, I think, a lack of understanding what that really means. They didn't want to become the dominant power within the European Union. And that's what many European countries ask today, Poland, for example, uh, but others as well. You have to take over this role because that's who you are. And Germans are, you know, because of this 70 years of pacifism, uh, reluctant. I mean, the political class, I think the Greens especially, uh, are telling their audiences, we have to change. And they make the point that you are making. But it's, uh, it is, you have then the, the left, uh, how should I say, the left over admiration for Russia within the Social Democratic Party, uh, to which Scholz belongs. Uh, they are, uh, still grateful, you know, for uh, what Willy Brandt, then he became chancellor in 69, was able of uh, accomplishing with his Ostpolitik. And then Khrushchev, uh, you know, and Gorbachev, especially Gorbachev, you know, uh, they are grateful for him and initially also to Putin. I mean, Putin gave him 2000, I think it was a speech in perfect German in, in front of the German parliament. And uh, that was uh, considered to be a milestone. Now, the interesting thing is Putin learned German in Dresden when he was there in charge of the KGB. <laughs> uh, I mean, and there's, this, there's this very famous uh, scene when in October of 89, uh, members of the East German um, dissident movement, the civil society movement, wanted to storm uh, the KGB headquarters in Dresden. And while Putin was still burning documents inside, he became aware of this threat. And so he went out and talked to them in German and talk them out of doing that. And they, uh, they went away. But that moment has traumatized Putin because he suddenly realized, you know, what social movements uh, in, in a society can do. And in a way you could say it's an anticipation of his fear uh, of what happened in Ukraine. I think the major reason for him to move in there, he was afraid, you know, that the Ukraine would become the model uh, for these for Russia. And uh, you know, his most uh, his most important opponent among the dissidents in Russia it, it was Alexei Navalny. 
uh, now Navalny uh, is uh, in prison, but they cannot kill him. And if he dies, a natural death, that will also become a signal, you know, he's afraid of, Putin is afraid of. And Navalny in the movie, you know, I don't know whether you've seen it or not, but if you have not seen it, watch it. It's a fascinating movie uh, because he, uh, he answers the question, what do we do if you die? And he simply said to the people who interviewed him, continue. And I think that's what uh, Putin is really scared of. He is scared but, of this kind of uh, civil society uprising, you know, that brought down the Soviet Union in uh, 1991, that brought down state socialism in all of Eastern European countries, including East Germany. And then he, he has this idiotic, uh, you know, notion of Russia and he feels Ukra the Ukraine, Ukraine does not have an identity, doesn't exist. And now, you know, for five months, the Ukrainians uh, demonstrate to him that they exist and they don't give in. Uh, it, it's it a quite the, prob the problem with that in the US, and I think it must also <clears throat> be something you can see in, in uh, Europe. Is that you get tired of it? You know, we call it news fatigue. Um, before, you know, these uh, atrocities were, you know, high news, buka, and all that. Uh, now it, uh, Putin, and Putin knows this. He knows this. And you keep on going. You keep on doubling down. You're persistent. You never back up. You never back off. And so, <clears throat> what you know, I think uh, uh, Germany is, um, you know, uh, in the same place as many people in this country. They're tired of hearing about it, no? And no, when you take no, 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 good, no, good, I good. Think, good. No, I, I do not think uh, that uh, Germany has uh, reached that point. And I think the Greens are really the people who remind them uh, of this issue. It is not simply, you know, this uh, violent invasion, but it's a moral issue. And uh, it's quite, uh, remarkable, you know, how they constantly make this issue. Habeck, the, the vice chancellor, and uh, Baerbock, uh, the foreign minister, wherever they go, they emphasize that. And uh, for that reason, you know, you have, it, the fatigue has not set in. So I, uh, and I don't know when it will whether it will set in anyway, well, at, at some point. But the interesting thing is the young people do not uh, compromise. And that is something new. And that I think could only have come from the Green Party. Because the other parties, even though the Christian Democrats, you know, Angela Merkel party, uh, Angela Merkel, Merkel's party certainly support also uh, the strong military support and financial support of the Ukraine. So in that sense, uh, we... Uh, well, we, uh, let's, can, we, can we look at the future together for a moment, Manfred? Just, just in case, for example, for whatever reason, whatever process, social, political process, uh, economic process, Germany softens on, on Putin. Um, and <clears throat> thus uh, soften on, on helping the Ukrainians and, and thus uh, soften on, on being a, um, a leader, the leader of Europe, especially in view of the decline of leadership uh, or political power in, in France and Italy and the UK. Um, and the what US. happened? And the US, thank you. Um, what happens then? What happens to Germany? What happens to France? And Italy and, and the UK, and for that matter, the US, um, what, happens, what happens to the world if, if Germany softens in its resolve? Yes, uh, in a way you could say the invasion 
on the 24th of February was the best that could have happened to the European Union, not only to NATO, but to the European Union. Uh, it brought them, um, you know, stronger together uh, and this division between the, the Eastern part, the Western part, the Southern part within the 27 uh, entity has become uh, not that important. You still have Orban uh, in Hungary, uh, but uh, I think uh, at this point, I mean, when you think of uh, Finland and Sweden applying uh, and becoming member of uh, NATO, I mean, both of them are member of the European Union. Um, then in Denmark, the attitude toward the military intervention by EU countries has also changed. Uh, they are in favor of it now. So what you have is, uh, I think, Macron's idea of a military uh, dimension of the European Union has uh, got much more accepted as a result of the invasion. Uh, everybody knows uh, what Putin is capable of uh, continuing to do uh, concerns everyone. So he will not stop, you know, with the Baltic states and maybe Georgia and Moldova. Uh, but uh, now then there's the possibility of a nuclear war. Uh, but look, I, before the 24th of February, I said Putin will not be so stupid to invade. And well, he was so stupid to do that. Now, you know, saying he will not be that stupid uh, to use nuclear weapons, I don't know, you know, whether he will be smart, whether he has learned the, uh, from what happened in, in the Ukraine. I mean, you have to understand that the resources that he has at hand are limited. Re I mean, he wants now to have a draft for all of uh, the Russian Federation. And that will create a lot of uh, hostility and opposition. I mean, in addition to the body bags that have already arrived, I mean, even if they don't admit, you know, how many people have been killed, uh, I mean, estimates say that there are more Russians that have been killed than Ukrainians. Uh, whether that's true or not, uh, maybe it's even but it goes into 10,000s. And uh, then you have this problem of uh, furbishing the military support system. I mean, now they try to get uh, 300 drones from Iran. And that is an indication, you know, how uh, really miserable uh, the military equipment part of the Russian military really is. But then the other long range issues, you know, with uh, Russia that will affect the survival of the system, you know, global warming has an impact of the permafrost uh, environment in, in Russia. And the more, uh, you know, the permafrost soil not only in Siberia, but in other parts begins to thaw, uh, the more problems it will be for the infrastructure. You know, buildings begin to collapse. Uh, so, you know, railway systems break down uh, as a result of, of that. So you have uh, really tremendous future problems that Putin is confronted with. And now when you're, when you're talking about the the energy uh, problem in, in, in Germany and other Western countries. I mean, Germany is uh, more exposed than, for example, France, because France has uh, close to 60 uh, nuclear power plants is still operating. Germany has three, but they will be closing down uh, very soon. That was Angela Merkel's decision after uh, the uh, catastrophe in, in Japan. 
you know, when she was standing next to Abe and uh, telling him, you know, we will close now all nuclear plants because of what happened here, uh, whether that was a mistake or not, but I mean, she was a chancellor and she was a physicist, <laughs> a degree in physics. And so uh, she made a lot of sense uh, at that at that point. But you have in Germany, you know, uh, really a major attempt to get energy, alternative energy. You know, when you are driving through Germany, you see everywhere the huge uh, solar fields uh, and the, the windmills uh, and uh, all kinds of other uh, projects are underway, supported not naturally by the Greens. You know, they are really the driving force behind. What that. about uh, what about gas, uh, liquid natural gas? You know, there was some discussion early on in this war where the U.S. was going to help Germany because it is trying to export LNG from the yes. U.S. Right. mainland to Europe. But right. the, the the response to that was it'll take years to build um, the receiving infrastructure to take the gas and you know, deploy the gas around the country. What's the status of that? Well, they are building one at the, at the Baltic Sea to connect uh, with uh, Norway. Uh, and then uh, near Bremer, Hoffman, Brehm, you know, so it's beginning and it takes less time than people have uh, assumed. So now you have the possibility of fracking in Germany also. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gas uh, underneath, but that is a no-no for the Greens. So you have you have uh, this as a problem uh, in the future. I mean, they have made compromises, the Greens, but uh, it will be very interesting to see how far they go. I mean, the guy who is really, I think, the next chancellor in Germany is now the vice chancellor. His name is Habeck, Robert Habeck. He is an incredible character. When you watch him speak, uh, when you see him in, in discussions with people, uh, he has all the stuff you know that you need in order uh, to get the problem solved. You know, Manfred, we're out of time, uh, but I, I do want to invite you back for a continuation of this discussion. Because yes. it has implications not only for Germany, no, uh, we no, need to discuss absolutely. other countries in Europe. We need to discuss the implications for countries outside of Europe, like the U.S., as a result of what is happening there. Well, there's one other thing, you know, that one has also to talk about, and that is how is the United States seen today in not only Germany, but in, in Europe? Uh, I mean, when you are thinking of the Supreme Court, uh, Germany has since 1948, when West Germany got uh, its uh, constitution, they have a Supreme Court that was built after the model of the American Supreme Court. But the German Supreme Court does not have these idiotic notion of lifetime uh, appointments of judges. Uh, and they have two senates, you know, two chambers. Uh, so judges, <laughs> the German Supreme Court are 10 years, they can become reappointed. And then what is, I think, very important, it's not the chancellor or the, or the president who appoint uh, the, the judges. No, you have a commission, the parliamentary commission uh, set up by, you know, the strengths of parties in, in, in the Bundestag that make these choices. That's uh, why we have to learn. We have to learn what happens yeah. in Europe. We oh, have no. to learn what happens in Germany. Germany has turned into a, a global leader and a, and a fulcrum on, on maintaining the liberal world order. As um, a result, as a result, don't forget that, as a result of being occupied from 1945 until 1990 by hundreds of thousands of American, British, French, and Soviet troops. So in a way you could say, uh, Germany has to thank these occupation forces that were there for 75 years, uh, that uh, it became pacified. Uh, but today you could say, well, these pacifying victors of World War II 
can learn from. Uh, yeah, the, the, the interesting how the tables have turned, man. For yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's all the other way now. We got to go. I, we we got to we got to we got to. Yes. Gotta, okay. We got to get off. But uh, Manf Manfred Henningsen, uh, an emeritus political science professor at UH Manoa, joins us from time to time. And this has been really enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.